You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. Robin, uh, I'd like to go into the story of the incredible impact of permaculture on Cuba. And I'd like to ask you uh, where you connected with the Cubans and, and why they, they chose you, you know, to come up and talk to and get them to get you to come to uh, Cuba to teach. The, there were some earlier connections via email, and the main connection was really at IPC 8 in Brazil, where we actually got to um, meet face-to-face. And uh, as we sort of talked about things and I, you know, talked about my work and what I've been doing. They saw my um, presentations there. Uh, They uh, said, well, look, you know, we're good at gardening, but we really need to go that next step. And uh, they felt that I had some of the specific uh, skills and experience that would um, help to support them in furthering their, their work. They also felt that they needed a person who had more experience with warm climate permaculture, so tropical, subtropical systems to also appraise what they were doing there. Um, I think a lot of the permaculturalists that have been to Cuba in the past were mainly coming from temperate climates. So there was a quite um, a number of elements of uh, tropical permaculture systems that hadn't really been introduced. So when I was over there last year, they found that are very exciting and inspiring. I found it immensely inspiring to see what they're doing over there. It's, um, it is really incredible. And Robin, do you feel that the greening of Cuba um, and their journey to an energy descent um, society would it will be a helpful model for the rest of the world? Uh, I think there is a lot that we can learn from Cuba. Uh, the, um, they, they had a, a, an instant overnight energy crash. Mm-hmm. It wasn't an energy descent. It was just an absolute crash. They just fell totally into a void from basically one day to the next. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a few key elements in uh, Cuba's capacity to survive. Um, and there's things, I suppose, in parallel with Russia because Russia which triggered the collapse of the USSR, which triggered the collapse in Cuba, um, also triggered the same kind of collapse in the East Bloc nations. And I think one of the important things there initially was the um, degree of social security that people had uh, from their uh, socialist regimes, where um, some form of base income was guaranteed, uh, the important things in Cuba was, uh, of course, immediately people started to grow food and take over uh, public space, and the government enabled that, um, permitted and enabled it. Um, one of the important things, I think, for Cuba too, was the government's immediate response in terms of decentralisation. And so very quickly they started to set up service nodes so that people could um, provide their basic needs, their essential needs, within walking distance of where they lived. And I think this is a really, really critical point that's often overlooked. Um, We talk a lot about the food production, and that is a really important part of it. But the decentralisation, I think, is uh, the other side of that survival coin. So no matter where you live in the city of Havana or any other city in Cuba, Within walking distance, you'll find a little service node where there's um, a fresh fruit and vegetable market and stalls. 
uh, there's um, a butcher, there's a baker, uh, there's banking facilities, uh, there's health facilities, there's a, um, a um, ration shop, there's a little supermarket, and um, also the decentralisation of education, particularly university education, so that people could access um, higher education from where they lived. So um, I think these were very, very critical components of uh, Cuba's survival, and that together with the phenomena of the uh, urban food production and the uh, land and agricultural reforms is what... Uh, largely enabled Cuba's survival. And when you look at Korea, North Korea, that had exactly the same phenomena happen there, the mass starvation that was happening in North Korea was uh, really tragic. I mean, people out eating dirt, uh, pulling up the last of the roots from the soil just to have something in their stomachs. Nothing like that happened in Cuba. That answered my question of, was there mass panic when this occurred in Cuba? Um, look, I don't know that there was mass panic. There was certainly concern. Um, things changed very quickly overnight. Um, the, in, in Cuba, there's actually a lot of trust in the government to be able to provide for people's needs. And the government immediately informed people that times were going to be very tough and that uh, they'd make sure that the little that they have would be shared throughout the population equitably. Uh, and they, um, I, mean, I, I wasn't there to experience, so I only know what I've been told by Cubans that were around during that time. Um, there's, I suppose there's a, um, a camaraderie in Cuba where they are, when they are faced with a disaster, they really pull together. Um, rather, that, you know, and you don't get the phenomena that you have um, sort of post disasters or, or crashes, uh, you know, of, of people looting and you know, sort of rioting on the streets. People trust the government that it, they're going to be fed, <laughs> they're going to have enough food for their stomachs, they're not going to lose their houses and their homes, and that um, even while resources are very uh, slim, that there will be a fairness in terms of their distribution. Hi, Robin. This is Margie, and we were in Brazil yeah. with you at the International Permaculture Convergence and first, we want to thank you for stopping on your way to, you know, to Cuba in California to uh, stop by and teach the courses this summer. Uh, we appreciate that very much. But I wondered uh, if you could tell us what your experience at the IPC8 was, and, and was it of value to you? And also, had you been to other international permaculture conferences? The IPC8 in Brazil was a very inspiring conference. I think it was probably the most uh, globally represented uh, convergence, international convergence and conference I've been to. Um, I think it was over 40 different countries were represented there, which was uh, very exciting. And uh, I just, um, I always find these kinds of gatherings, uh, some of the... Um, best, um, what do you call it, sort of recharge of uh, one's spirit uh, and uh, than, than or almost any other kind of event. Uh, I hadn't been to an international conference for quite some time. I was at the first IPC1 here in Australia in 1984, that was, and uh, then uh, the one in the US in 86. Then in 1989, uh, it was held in New Zealand. Um, I missed the next few because of uh, work commitments here, and actually I think one of them I actually missed because of a car accident. Uh, but um, the IPC6 in Perth I attended. That was also very inspiring. And then IPC8 in Brazil. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be getting to Africa this year. I think one of the things that's really important is, and I, I, I really, if I don't connect on this level with my peers and colleagues, 
um, I, I really feel a deficit in myself. I think it's important as a teacher and designer that I keep up to date with what other people are doing on the planet. And for me, the body of knowledge and experience of permaculture is constantly growing and expanding. And I think it's important, uh, those of us that are key communicators and trainers, that we are constantly updating ourselves. Um, so there's, there's that aspect in terms of professional development. And uh, for me, the, one of the most inspiring things is to see what people are actually doing in developing nations or the two-thirds world, where I think permaculture is doing some of its most critical and important work. And would you encourage others in the permaculture community to attend these international conferences, even though we're all concerned about our carbon footprint and are hesitating to travel so much? We found it of extreme value, and uh, would you encourage others to attend? I certainly would. Uh, it's, it's a one-off. It's, and I think in terms of carbon expenditure, it's not like just you know, flying to Bali to sit on the beach for two weeks. You know, that I really um, ca I can't justify that kind of travel. But uh, to go to a conference like this where... Uh, and I, I think it's really important to go there to learn as much as possible and to get other people's stories to bring home with you so that you can then um, reinvest what uh, carbon has been spent in your local community, in your bioregion, in your greater geographic region um, by inspiring and empowering others with these stories and I think particularly now as we are coming into such critical times um, we've got you know that the issues are accelerating the response has to be very rapid and a lot of people um, I think are, are quite afraid of the future I think that's why we get a lot of denialists in terms of climate change because people just don't know how to respond and the other side of that, too, I think, from the um, Western world, um, we've got a massive responsibility to reduce our footprint because it's our excessive footprint and excessive consumption and affluence which is actually creating the whole problem. So I think it's really important for us to touch base with what people are doing in resource-constrained um, environments how they survive, how they live well, very simply. And I think some of this simple living, this simple survival is some of the most important lessons that we can learn firsthand from a gathering like this to bring home and inspire people to a single earth footprint. Just wanted to say that the uh, next International Permaculture Conference and Convergence will be happening in Africa in October and November 2009, and um, you can go to www.ipc.org. That's International Permaculture. Con org. And um, the next question, or I'd like to ask, is, you know, at the uh, Brazilian, uh, where we had the eighth conversion, the um, Cuban permaculturist got up and um, actually thanked Australia for coming to the Australians for coming to Cuba in 1993. They said it was when they were suffering the most, when they had their worst, worst time, is when the permaculturists arrived. And I think Roberto uh, Perez said, you know, permaculture was given a level playing field to enter into Cuba, and that's why it made such an impact. Um, maybe if you can take that, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, question and, and see and uh, give us some further uh, observations. And also, could you talk about your trip in Cuba, that you went from one end of the island to the other and what you saw? Yes. Um, the, so one of the things with Cuba, it didn't have a history of horticulture. And that was one of the biggest struggles. People did not know how to garden. They did not know how to farm. Cuba came from hundreds of years of exploitation of uh, plantations. 
um, with the slave trade and then when the slave trade finished, well, basically the same people continued working under the uh, colonial powers and then um, I suppose after the revolution, things sort of pretty much continued uh, with, um, you know, the, um, the, the big um, government plantations and so... Cuba's agriculture was really plantation-based. It was export-based. Um, at the time of the crisis um, and the special period, I mean, Cuba had been importing over 80% of its food. Um, so there, there wasn't a tradition of growing vegetables, of horticulture, apart from commercial orange um, citrus crops. Uh, for people to fall back on. So they had to actually learn from scratch how to garden. And when permaculture came in with uh, effective methodologies and skills and, um, and, and particularly strategies for self-reliance, uh, one of the issues with you know, trying to grow food is that most of the agricultural advice in the planet is geared towards you know, large-scale production, which is very dependent on machinery and fossil fuels. And permaculture is the antithesis to that, and that was exactly what was required. So it, uh, it helped the Cubans a quantum leap in terms of being able to reach food security and come up with very creative ideas to use vertical space and rooftops and container gardening and um, integrated farming and the... Uh, examples over there um, are, are truly inspiring. I'm, uh, it was um, an incredible joy and privilege for me to spend uh, 40 days in Cuba last year. And I got to visit 40 projects, uh, the length and the breadth of the country. Um, I think some of the most impressive ones were actually in the um, provincial city of Sancta Spiritus, where I visited 11 projects in two days, and um, there were urban projects plus uh, one of the uh, best permaculture farms in Cuba. Uh, the urban permaculture systems are um, immensely inspiring. Uh, there was uh, one uh, in the uh, provincial city of Palma Soriano that I visited, and uh, would probably be around about an acre of land squeezed in between and around uh, high-rise apartments, um, sort of old, old sort of Russian-style apartments. And this little garden is absolutely chock-a-block, um, multiple stacks. You know, they've got all these lovely trellises with uh, trellis crops on them and growing their um, light-sensitive lettuces and salad greens underneath. They had an integrated aquaculture system. So on the highest point, all the water before it went to the vegetables um, goes through a, a, an aquaculture pond uh, with uh, growing tilapia. Um, perched above the pond um, is the rabbits that are fed waste from the gardens and the manures from the rabbits um, go into the compost and then uh, any excess nutrients wash into the tilapia pond to feed the tilapia. And, and this little garden is just feeding hundreds of people from this tiny space. Um, and when you see things like that, it's, you, just, you wonder why we need farms, you know, and so much food can be grown in the city right next to where people live. And one of the things that I read in one of your articles, Robin, was that in Havana, in Cuba, there are 20,000 small gardens and that actually Havana produces 60% of um, its fruits and vegetables, which is an amazing statistic. Mm, it is. And, uh, and, like, there's not a lot of backyard gardens. I, that was one thing I was surprised. There's not an awful lot of home production, except amongst the permaculturalists. Because there is, you know, there's there's no tradition of um, no real tradition of gardening there or of horticulture, but uh, the all these little tiny bits of open space and the old car parks and um, at just about every vacant uh, allotment in the city is turned 
into a food garden. And uh, many of them just have a little stall, a little kiosk at the gate where they sell the products fresh to the uh, you know, residents from the local community. Then there's also the um, growers' market uh, for the uh, growers that live on the peri-urban areas, so the outer suburbs where there's a little more space. And there you'll actually uh, find a lot of um, cooperative uh, farms on small areas, but it is really amazing some of the little areas that have become so immensely productive. And it really gives a lot of hope that we can provide a lot of our food right where we live. The, um, I suppose the main thing uh, is uh, getting the um, carbohydrate crops, you know, the grain crops. And I think if we can shift away from a largely grain-dominated staple diet to a more tuber-dominated staples, uh, we could produce even more of our food within our urban environment. So of the people that are growing food and veg fruits and vegetables in these vacant lots, are most of them, do they do this for their living or is it just something they do in their extra time? Most of them, they do it for their living. And so our urban food production has created something like 200,000 jobs in, um, just in Havana alone. And there's many other um, provincial cities in Cuba where you get, um, you know, sort of, um, I suppose in relationship to population, similar figures. And uh, that's one of the interesting things, uh, I think, about the, the entire phenomena is that... Uh, a lot more people are actually uh, gainfully employed, um, earning their living from food production in the city than growing the equivalent food on, um, you know, broad acre farmland. And uh, so it's um, yeah, that entire um, employment side of things, I think, is uh, very, very fascinating. And I suppose the other thing, too, is that these small-scale, intensive, owner-operated enterprises um, far outproduce corporate farms, uh, government farms, and um, the, the, the smaller scale the production system is, the more productive it is per unit space. I read, too, in your article that in 1989, um, the food shortages in Cuba led the government to pass a law that allowed anyone to farm or cultivate a vacant lot. So I think that, hopefully, that will happen here in the States as well. That was one of the immediate responses after the collapse of the USSR. And I think uh, it's so important that governments can respond quickly and definitively uh, in crisis to enable people to provide their needs. Um, and the, um, one of the things with the reforms too around that time was uh, allowing people to actually farm as small private enterprises, which was a, a, a very big thing for Cuba uh, with its um, sort of communist ideology. Uh, where, um, you know, sort of individual enterprise wasn't really part of their vocabulary beforehand. But in terms of growing food, people could actually, um, you know, operate a, a private enterprise on a piece of land. And uh, then also the uh, use of roofs, making land available on leaseholds that are transferable and inheritable. Um, provided they grow food, um, made a big difference too. And so they're, 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 and they're still uh, working on building up their food security capacity. They haven't achieved 100% food security yet. And the cyclones last year, the hurricanes last year, uh, have really um, set things back a long way. And so there's a, a, a long protracted recovery process from the biggest natural disaster they ever had. They almost call it, uh, they call it, it's, a, it's like a second uh, special period that Cuba's going through now. Robin, to further go on uh, talking about the, the hurricanes, um, just to give people a little idea of uh, 
how much impact it made on 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 Cuba. You know, uh, they evacuated about twenty one percent of their population. Three million people had to be evacuated out of a population of eleven point five million people. Four hundred and forty thousand houses damaged. Uh, Sixty three house thousand houses destroyed. Electrical systems. Uh, forty nine thousand tons of stored food uh, damaged. Uh, Half a million chickens destroyed, uh, killed, uh, farmland flooded. It was an immense impact. Uh, like you said, it was like the, the worst disaster uh, for a hurricane they ever faced. And on top of that, the embargo, which didn't allow supplies to yep. flow smoothly into the country. I find that really inhumane. <laughs> um, and what really shocks me is the number of people that are completely unaware that there was this disaster in, um, in, in Cuba. And the, the silence of the media on that, I think, has really got a lot to answer for. And yet the, you know, one of the amazing things was one of the first countries to respond was Little East Timor, which is so poor and so struggling to rebuild itself. Um, the day after the first major hurricane hit, um, that was Gustav, uh, they immediately offered half a million dollars in aid. Um, and I, I just find that degree of generosity uh, incredibly warming. Don't you find that Cuba has shared with people all around the world, with their doctors, with their help? I know that uh, mm. uh, doctors across borders just, you know, so admires the doctors. They use them all over the world, hire them in place of uh, more expensive Western doctors. And also that the Cuban doctors can work in areas where there isn't a high-tech, you know, solution, where you need to know the mm. rudimentary things of medicine. And Cuban doctors are just incredible for that. Uh, that's one of the benefits that's come out of the blockade because Cuba hasn't had access to, um, you know, uh, Western uh, technology, medicines and so forth. They've had to uh, reinvent their health system primarily based on preventative health and then come up with low-tech ways of treating complicated medical issues. Uh, the... Um, the, the health revolution, I think, is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, that was one of the reasons why East Timor immediately responded because East Timor has got uh, 1,100 um, Cuban doctors and health workers working there. Uh, because they, they just, you know, they, there's I think several hundred East Timorese in Cuba being trained as doctors. Um, Cuba's got more doctors around the world in third world nations than the World Health Organization. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? That's and it's amazing. part of um, it's it's part of the social conscience uh, is to share with people in need, and um, it's one of the things that I found. Um, I suppose, in a way, a little confronting about Cuba was. And it is a third world country. And when I've, I've traveled so much in third world countries, and you, you, you sort of you get so used to seeing the incredible disparity between the haves, the have too much, and the have absolutely nothing. And in Cuba, there's no homelessness, uh, there's no shanty towns, there's no people living in cardboard boxes, uh, sleeping in the street, begging. Um, everybody has got their basic needs provided. And there's this um, basic this generosity of spirit uh, that's very deep in the Cuban psyche. Um, and that is also in the, uh, for a lot of the government policies of helping the poorest of the poor and a, a commitment to human dignity in terms of security, of uh, food, food security, health security, and education. Yeah. Education is the other area that they're doing a lot of work, particularly uh, in uh, Latin America. I would like to say, you know, that the Cubans have really been acknowledged for 
their work, um, especially during the special period. You know, the Wright High Livelihood Award in 1999, the Alternative Nobel Prize for the Organic Agriculture Group and the Cuban Association of Agriculture and Forestry Technicians. They got that award as a group for all their work in transforming Cuban uh, agriculture. And then the other one that you've written a lot about, you know, in, in your write-up about Cuba is the uh, 2007 Living Planet Report released by the World Wildlife Fund. And maybe you can talk about that because I think you've got a really good insight in your writings. Yes, well, the, um, that was a very, very interesting report. And they studied over 130 countries. And Cuba was the only nation on the planet that uh, is living within its ecological footprint, uh, but also has a, a first world standard in terms of the United Nations Human Development Index. Um, that uh, relates to... Uh, longevity, um, infant mortality rates, health and literacy, uh, and housing. Um, and Cuba actually puts countries like Australia and the U.S. to shame. Uh, they've, they've got um, a higher level of literacy than than most of the uh, first world can even boast. Um, so one of the things uh, that I was looking at when I was in Cuba, one of the filters that I was exploring Cuba with was not just, uh, you know, permaculture and the food production, but what actually is a single planet footprint. Uh, now, a lot of people aren't really clear with what um, footprints mean. Now, if um, everybody on all 8 billion people on this planet um, lived like Cubans, we could survive uh, with the resource base that we have on planet Earth. If everybody on Earth lived like an Australian, we'd need 3.4 planets. If everybody lived like an American, no, uh, Australia, 3.7 planets, that's right, and I think we, if we all lived like the average US citizen, uh, we would need uh, 5.4 planets. And that's clearly not sustainable. Now, I suppose for me it was um, quite a bit to come to terms with just seeing how resource poor Cubans are. A lot of that is sort of due to the blockade, but it was a, an incredible litmus or reality test for just how, we, how severely we have to reduce our consumption to live within a one Earth footprint. It, it is a serious challenge. We've really got to redesign our whole society. We've got to redesign our economies. We've got to contract down. We've got to uh, reinvent ourselves as a, a negative growth society uh, to achieve a, an equitable footprint. And at the same time, as we tighten our belts, we need to be supporting the uh, disadvantaged countries and nations uh, in terms of uh, food security, health security, and housing security. And it's interesting um, to see how those three things, uh, where they are provided for, as in Cuba, um, you've got very low birth rates. I mean, Cuba is actually negative growth in terms of population. So it's got the similar sort of negative growth syndrome as most European nations. Uh, whereas in the third world, where people do not have security, their security is having children because there's very low infant um, survival rates or high infant mortality rates. So people have got to have a lot of children just to have a couple survive. Um, they, their children are their insurance in terms of old age because there's no old age pensions. Um, there's very few people have access to any form of education, let alone any higher education. Um, and so it's interesting how I, I think that you know, the issues of uh, resource dispersal of uh, population uh, really comes down to lifting up the poorest of the planet, and we really need to pull down the um, the affluence. 
a big challenge. Robin, could you tell our listeners a bit about CAPE, the um, Cuba-Australian Permaculture Exchange Program? Yes, that came out of the uh, our meetings in um, Brazil at IPC8. And uh, the Cubans were really keen to also sort of revitalize the relationship with Australia because there has been that long history there and uh, there's been... There hadn't been much happening for around uh, you know, eight or ten years. So um, I felt that in the current climate, Australia had a lot to learn from Cuba, and uh, the Cuban permaculture movement felt that you know there was a lot that they needed to um, build on to go the next step. So we came up with the concept of an exchange, a two-way exchange, so rather than talking about sort of aid, which is very much a one-way and can be interpreted as a patronising thing where, you know, I'm the expert and I'm going to come and help you, um, it's, uh, it's a very, very equitable thing where we recognise that uh, we both have a lot to give and learn from each other. So uh, we got Roberto Perez out here to Australia for a major speaking tour. He gave... Um, 28 presentations in four states and spoke to over 5,000 people uh, live and heavens knows how many tens of thousands of people have listened to him on radio and podcasts and so forth. It um, was a very, very inspiring thing for Australia. And what was interesting was the collective of people that came together uh, to host his various events in different parts of Australia. Um, it was uh, fascinating to be at the uh, presentation at uh, Wallara City Council, which is in the um, Blue Ribbon North Shore of Sydney. This is sort of one of the uh, bastions of ultra-conservative um, extreme right politics in Australia. And this extreme right um, Labor Par Liberal Party mayor stands up and introduces Roberto and praises Cuba and what we've got to learn from it in these times of peak oil <laughs> in terms of um, attaining a more sustainable lifestyle. And so we had groups coming together which involved uh, church groups, uh, all spectrums of um, you know political colours from red and green through to uh, ultra-conservative, um, we had environment groups, we had uh, solidarity groups, we had uh, community garden groups, permaculture groups, universities, local governments collaborating and working together to host Roberto in their areas. And it has given an incredible boost to uh, you know the transition town movement, the climate change movement and the um, urban gardening and community garden movement in Australia. And uh, then that was followed up by my visit to Cuba uh, to um, support them and consult on their projects there and conduct some training and seminars and so forth. Um, we are now in the process of formalising um, our agreement uh, with um, Erda Institute and the a foundation for Nature and Humanity in Havana. That's the key NGO uh, that um, is coordinating the permaculture projects over there uh, to um, take this into the future and formalise it and um, hopefully start to develop some structured internships and um, that, that work both ways. We'd like to raise funds to you know, bring... Uh, some of the leading permaculture teachers from Cuba out here to do some of the advanced follow-on training uh, with the APT so that they can go back and start to introduce vocational training in Cuba uh, in permaculture and um, as well as you know, ongoing visits over there to work with them on their projects and uh, gain inspiration from them and uh, take their lessons on board and bring them back home. Uh, we also 
had an appeal and uh, raised some money which has been sent over to help with the post-hurricane recovery. And my trip there in uh, June this year will be largely to uh, evaluate where things are at with the post-hurricane recovery, learn from their experiences. Um, I've had uh, just a few phone conversations and some short emails um, regarding this, but uh, apparently the permaculture projects uh, manage, were a lot more resilient than the non-permaculture ones. So I'm really interested to see what their lessons were, what their observations were. Uh, they also, on the indefatable Cubans, just immediately said, well, okay, we've lost everything, our garden's been destroyed, everything's been washed away, uh, but look at all the organic matter there is out there to harvest and get the compost happening to get the gardens growing again. And while, yeah, we've lost all these years of work, this has given us an opportunity for redesign and to learn from um, the mistakes that we've made in the past and build these lessons into redesigning our systems to be more productive and more resilient in the future. That's wonderful, Robin. Now, if you could, um, we're, we've come to the end of, of this interview. If you could share with our listeners your contact information and if they would like to get involved with CAPE and um, or any of your many other wonderful projects. The best contact is uh, my website, which is www.permaculture.com.au. So thank you so much, Robin Francis, for joining us today. I have in the studio with me Wesley Rowe and Margie Bushman of the Santa Barbara Permaculture Network. Okay, thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.